The night that Woody was found, the coroner asked, was Woody taking any medication? And the only medication Woody was on was Zoloft. And so wow. she took that out. And then also that same night that Woody was found, there was an article in the front page of our newspaper that said the UK finds link between antidepressants and suicide in teens. One of the first things that we found out is when we Googled Zoloft and suicide, that the FDA had hearings in 1991 when it was on mm -hmm. um, just Prozac and the emergence of violence and suicide. Like after Woody died, I had doctors who said, do you think you need something? And I was like, I looked at her. First of all, I think this drug is what killed my husband. And then I looked at her, I go, but my husband died, aren't I supposed to hurt? And she literally said to me, but you don't need to. Oh my God. Kim, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kim Witzak, she's the consumer rep for um, uh, uh, over at the FDA. So she sits on panels and she evaluates um, and, and she participates in decisions about what the FDA is going to do, uh, do with drugs. And she really has a focus on safety issues. The topic that we're really going to be going into depth today is why aren't some of the problems uh, with psychiatric drugs more widely recognized? I mean, there's a massive disconnect between what people find out, you know, when they are harmed by these drugs. And then also what we see in the lay media, what we see in academic journals, what your doctor knows. And so why is there this huge gap? And Kim is just the perfect person to talk about this. Uh, she, you know, and she's going to tell us why, and then she's going to tell us what she learned about, um, about why these, th why there's this huge disconnect, um, from her experience as the consumer rep. So Kim, thank you so much. Uh, d d just go for it. Great. Well, thanks for having me. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, it's a really good question because I think for a lot of people, you know, like myself, I, you know, this was a very personal journey that started the curiosity and the asking the questions. But let me just go back and, and tell you how I got into this. I like to call myself the accidental uh, advocate because I never set out to do the, any of this drug safety work. However, on, um, but sometimes our greatest purposes choose us. And on August 6, 2003, so um, over 20 years ago, I got a call that forever changed the trajectory of my life. My dad called to tell me that my husband was found dead, hanging at age 37. And Woody wasn't depressed. Woody had no history of depression. Woody had just started his dream job with a startup company and was having trouble sleeping, which is not uncommon for entrepreneurs, right? And Woody went to his doctor. And Woody was a guy who always needed eight hours of sleep. And he went to go see his doctor who has always fixed him. You know, I say fixed him because he was an athlete. So, you know, they stitched him up. They fixed his knees. And so he really trusted his doctor. And the doctor gave him a three-week sample pack of Zoloft and said it would take the edge off and help him sleep. And... So Woody went home, trusted that this drug that he was given that was going to take the edge off. And I happened to be out of the country the first three weeks he was on the drug. So when I came back, I'll never forget, you know, um, something that I saw that will forever haunt me. But it was also something super now looking back. It was really informative. And um, mm -hmm. I was waiting for Wood to come home from work. And he came in, dropped his um, bag at the back door, completely drenched through his dress shirt and fell on the, to the floor in a fetal position, and his hands wrapped around his head, and he kept rocking back and forth and bawling. And he's like, Kim, you got to help me. My head's outside my body. you got to help me. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm losing my mind. And I remember like, oh, my God, we've been married for almost 10 years. I've never seen this behavior. Wow. But, you know, we calmed him down. We got him to do breathing. We did um, praying. And eventually he called his doctor and the, told him what happened. And the doctor said, you got to give this drug four to six weeks to kick in. So oh every night the next yeah. week, Wood came home and he'd be like, what do you think about hypnosis? What do you think about acupuncture? Everything was beat this feeling in his head where he felt like he was outside his body looking in. And so, you know, we never once, um, you know, questioned. So when I got that call, it made no sense to me, right? Like, what? 
What do you love life? Like he wasn't depressed. Like, what are you talking about? Even during this time, he was like, he was a big runner and he wasn't running his traditional like 10, 12 miles. He was only able to do three miles. And that was something that was odd to him. Right. And he also talked about having nightmares that he, because he always said he didn't dream. So like all of these things were like said to me, but we didn't know what we didn't know. Right. But the night that Woody was found, the coroner asked, and it was my busy time of year, the coroner asked, was Woody taking any medication? And the only medication Woody was on was Zoloft. And she said, we're going to take it with us. It might have something to do with his death. And so wow. she took that out. And then also that same night that Woody was found, there was an article in the front page of our newspaper that said the UK finds link between antidepressants and suicide in teens. And so what year really, was this? Uh, 2003. Okay. 2003. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, you know, of course, when that happened, you know, I'm trying to get, figure out how I'm getting home. And I just remember thinking, uh, like, where's the note? Like, you know, Woody and I left notes all the time. So like every single thing about his death was completely out of, character for who the person he was. Cause I'm like, we traveled a lot. There were no, you know, we always left notes for each other. So for this biggest mm -hmm. trip of his year, you know, his life, um, taking his own life, there was no note except for the two hints. And thank God we had those the night that Woody was found that really, because Woody's death. And I, you know, I say this a lot with even just suicides in general, or when something like tragic mm -hmm. happens, people go on a, curiosity, you know, like what happened and like almost yeah. as if it's a mystery, you know, law and order kind of putting all the pieces together. And that's really kind of what we did. But, you know, I'll, we never, the one thing that we didn't do is we didn't question the drug because it was given to him by his doctor. It was advertised, sold and, um, as, um, and sold as safe and effective. And it was FDA approved. So like, all the, like, there was no reason for us, to, and we, neither of us had any experience with any of these mental health drugs to, or history mm -hmm. in the mental health space. So, like, we didn't even know that, you know, we're just thinking, oh, it's a pill, you take it, you know, kind of doing what a lot of people did. And truthfully, we were just, we just blindly trusted. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, going back to your initial question of how did we get here, and, and I do believe, there is something with this, the system is set up to blindly trust. And, and that goes, yeah, well, and you, you know, and, and then one, of, and one of the things that's interesting is, you know, it doesn't just happen when you go in and you see your doctor and they say, Hey, you should take this because it's, it's in the media, you know, it's in newspaper articles. You've seen it on TV. By that time, you and Woody had probably heard of, you know, many favorable sound bites about, antidepressants and possibly the seriousness of untreated anxiety and depression. And so you're almost kind of seasoned that when you do go into the doctor and they say, hey, this drug is safe and effective, you go, well, he's saying it's safe and effective, but I've actually heard this so many times that it just feels true. You know, this is, you know, I've, you know, I've heard about listening to Prozac, all of these things. This is not a big deal. Like I can really go with it. Yeah, I think, you know, I really even go back. I don't even know that I heard anything because it was so not in that space of even paying yeah. attention to antidepressants. I don't even know that, I don't even think Woody was told it was an antidepressant because I think if Woody was actually even told it was an antidepressant, he would have said, well, I'm not depressed, right? I think mm -hmm. because he didn't get it for, he actually, the diagnosis that he got it for was insomnia. He wasn't sleeping. And so the doctor, yeah. his GP is like, hey, take this. It'll take the edge off. And I'm oh sure, you know, it's like the whole idea of just that, like, take the edge off. And so, you know, at that point, um, there were no warnings like there are today. And, and also, it's funny that we're having the show because I believe that we need to keep reminding people of the warnings because one of the first things that we found out is when we Googled Zoloft and suicide, that the FDA had hearings in 1991 when it was on mm -hmm. um, just Prozac and the emergence of violence and suicide. 
and there were huge mm-hmm. hearings and apparently it was all over the media back then. But, you know, I was like just getting, you know, I was in college, so I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening on the national scale, on the news. Um, again, antidepressants, mental health drugs, like that wasn't even in part of either of our families kind of history, Mm -hmm. even knowing. But, you know, that was shocking to us that in 1991, there were hearings. And so that at that time, every one of the advisory board members, which today I sit on that same committee, the Psychopharmologic Drugs Advisory Committee, every one of those guys took money and worked with or in conjunction with um, research for the institutions, you know, the other manufacturers of antidepressants or other psychiatric drugs. So I had no idea. At that point, the FDA told these guys to, um, cause they all voted no, they didn't see any link, um, or emergence, you know, mm-hmm. like any issue. So they voted no. And then, um, they were, they were told, Eli Lilly was told to study suicidality. And then the FDA, so I don't know if they ever did, although they were looking at it because one of the things that we found out through all this is, and we'll get into it um, in a little bit, but it's, I had a lawsuit against um, Pfizer, a wrongful death failure to warn lawsuit, and we got all kinds of documents out that showed a very different story than what was even being told to the advisory board members. Let, let's pick up there because we, we, we can hit the data around suicidality later on, but I, I think it's, it would be really interesting to ask you, when, you know, when, did the shoe, when did the shoe drop? When did you start to notice that maybe something was going on with the drug um, after, after Woody's passing? What, what led you to that? Because, yeah, like you said, you eventually, I know you, we, we talked before, you eventually meet David Healy and, um, and, you, and you go into that lawsuit. So I'd like to hear just briefly about that process. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think probably the first thing was really this intuitive sense in me that Woody wasn't depressed. Right. And everybody, Mm -hmm. everybody around, like even one of the first things that I did after Wood died is, you know, the funeral home and everybody said I should go to these suicide support groups, which I did. And in that, in the suicide support groups, every one of them are like, we've been, we never saw it happening to our loved one. They like almost patted me on the head. Like I was making this up that I couldn't accept it. And they kept saying, um, well, Woody must've been depressed. And I was like, no, he wasn't depressed. And I go, I think it was the medication. And they were like, cause I was like, what else had changed in Woody's life? Right. So that was like, it was super clear. Woody, like one of the other things, because I, again, going back to just knowing who he was, he didn't drink, like he didn't, he was like, he didn't drink. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have, um, the only thing he literally, and he couldn't have caffeine because his body got super sensitive to it. He couldn't do NyQuil because in the morning he was hung over from NyQuil. And so he had a super sensitive body. And so literally it was, it was as clean as, as day with, Like he went from not being able to sleep, head outside the body and being dead in five weeks. And so Mm -hmm. I think it started there and then it became, well, then, you know, Googling and finding out antidepressants and then you start going down that rabbit hole, right? And then started pulling all this material and articles that we, um, that actually came from 91 and then looking at what the UK was doing, right? At this point, they were already coming out with some of the warnings. And then it mm-hmm. really became like, what can we do that this never happens to somebody else? Is we started going out to D.C. and meeting with our members of Congress and getting into meetings at the FDA, then realized that there were lawsuits that were happening. Like, you know, there, some, there were some big uh, Zoloft suicide lawsuits there were also some Paxil or Paxil, I believe, as well as Prozac mm-hmm. murder. Like then we started going yep. just down and starting again, going back to the law and order kind of thing, putting things together, thinking, how is this all coming? Like, how come we didn't know any of this? And then really it became when and my brother-in-law, I have to give him a lot of the credit because I was just figuring out how to ch- live my new life. And my brother-in-law started, ordered one of the first things he did the night Woody was found is he ordered three books, um, Let Him Eat Prozac 
antidepressant facts um, by Peter Bregan, David Healy, yep. and then there was another one by um, Dr. Joe Glenmullen, and yep. ordered these books off the internet. And I don't think he slept for like a week straight because he's reading everything. And then that eventually led us to a conversation. And it's one thing I always say now is if there's somebody that you want to meet, it's amazing how people will like David Healy actually wrote that, you know, he was like this big famous person over in the UK working on antidepressants and, and, Mm -hmm. and reading him, we contacted Dr. Healy and had a conversation and we said, we want to do something with this. And then that's really where we learned about the lawyers the, and there was mm-hmm. a couple big lawyers that were actually doing it. And the one, so we had, inver, you know, in, um, informational interviews with them because I really wanted to see like kind of their motivation as well. Because for me, Woody's dead and I don't care, it, like yes. no money would ever bring him back. But I wanted to have advocate lawyers that wanted to do what they could to get warnings. Um, and then... So anyways, we ultimately went with Bomb Headland, which um, was out mm-hmm. in L.A., and went out there, met with them, and started seeing documents that, because they had already discovered it in other lawsuits. So it wasn't, mm-hmm. and that's the beauty of, and the importance of lawsuits, is that we're able to go into the company files and see what was known. And that was really when you started so there was a document when I tell you that head outside the body, it was the yes. um, Australian uh, or South African um, regulators, um, FDA equivalent, mm-hmm. writing to Pfizer's chief medical officer, Dr. Roger Lane, talking about doctors reporting patients on 50 milligrams, which is what Woody was on, where they were standing outside their bodies and looking in. The exact same thing that Woody said, and then the his response back, Dr. Roger Lane's response back to um, the authorities, the regulators, was it happens on on all SSRIs. We don't know why. And I'm like, wait, you guys knew? Like Woody's mm-hmm. had this head outside the body that every night he came home, and you guys knew, and you wouldn't tell doctors. And so I think that was the other thing when I started. So, you know, the lawyer piece was huge because it was no longer my story um, or, you know, Woody's story. It was like, wait, this is on black and white, their letterhead, not mine. Like, this is on FDA's Mm -hmm. letterhead, not mine. And it was all this stuff of piecing it together. Uh, And then there were FDA hearings as well at this point where it was um, we went out and started connecting with all these families that had very similar experiences as Woody, where they weren't, their loved ones were not given antidepressants for depression. Because if you listened at that time, and but to your point mm-hmm. earlier about being conditioned, that it was the company's response every time was, oh, well, suicide's inherent in the depression, the disease of depression. So that was their response with everything to do with antidepressants being any type of involvement in like these suicides because a lot of the people that we started meeting uh, were people that were given like test kids test anxiety they were moving it was all of these different type they weren't depression a breakup like somebody broke up um, somebody didn't get a job right after college I mean it's this kind of like superior position where it's just like you think that it was the medication you clearly don't know enough about depression. You know, we, we know more than you do, you know, this is like what it is, but, um, and I mean, it's just, it's, it's not the case. I mean, I feel like, and this was especially in my training and I feel like depression became more and more like this over time was they want it to be a mystery. You know, they, they want it to be an unpredictable illness that, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and it's not kind of boxed in in any way because then they can kind of, you know, gaslight you in some ways to say, oh yeah, it's normal for you to experience, it's, it's depersonalization. You know, when, when you feel like you're looking back at yourself, that's normal. You know, it's, it's, it's normal to lie on the ground with akathisia and, you know, internal terror and torment. That's normal. That's part of your depression. And then they'll sit there straight face and they'll say to the people 
whose loved ones have gone through this, you know, you clearly didn't know them. You don't know them as well as we do because we know yeah, depression totally. and that's what it is. Yeah. Um, it's really crazy. It's, it's so true. Yeah. You nailed it. You nailed it on the head. Yeah. Like we actually, with these families that we met after the FDA advisory committee, right? We went and met personally with Dr. Um, Temple, Bob Temple and um, Tom Lochran at the FDA who were responsible for the approval of these drugs. And we met and told our loved ones stories. And this was one of those aha. So I had so many ahas that kept popping up, right? Like thinking, well, we're coming to you telling you this story. Like Woody has never had history of depression. Woody went from taking a drug, um, head outside the body, and another week later, he hung himself? Like that doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't you be curious to go and investigate? Like, so I thought when we brought all these stories to the FDA, they would have been interested in digging deeper, kind of like a plane crash, right? So if a plane crash goes down, you know, you'd get the black box, you go in and do an entire analysis. And I get it that it's one person, but like it's so random out of the blue, right? And there was other families there too. And the FDA, literally Bob Temple said, well, this didn't, we never, we didn't see this happen. These are just anecdotes. That's what he was like. Oh, you know, these are just anecdotes. We never saw these happening in the clinical trials. And so he, and I'm yeah. like, did he just call us anecdotes? I think he did. So that actually, well, the I'm, thing is, I'm like looking, yeah. I have my button that says we are not anecdotes that I created. I um, want one. We matter. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it so was the, insulting. It was super insulting. Well, but it's also completely incompetent as well. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing was, I don't, I don't want to go into the data too much, but I'm going to give like a brief overview uh, because I, uh, I am familiar a lot with the story, especially what happened in 91 and then what happened in the hearings in 2005 and ultimately the box warning. But back in 91, okay, so this was happening. People were saying, hey, you know, I know my spouse, I know my ch child and they never would have done this. And that, and that led to the first hearing. <clears throat> At that time, Charles Beasley from Eli Lilly, uh, chief medical officer, they, they did a meta-analysis and essentially what, the, what that was is they just looked at the clinical trial data and, and they said, okay, so we've got some outcomes that which we could look at to see if there's, you know, if, if people are becoming suicidal. And so they, they, they looked at the number of like suicide attempts on the group on the, on the placebo and then they looked at the number of suicide attempts on the group taking the drug. And um, although there was more on the group taking the drug, it was not statistically significant. And so they said, well, you know, look, there's, there's no difference, not a statistical difference. So, you know, we can't say this is the case. And, you know, there's something that happens when you start talking about statistics and clinical trial design. People start to get bamboozled in a way. They're just like, oh, my God, this is starting to be complicated. You know, statistics are hard. I don't really understand it. But, oh, wow, we have these, you know, high-powered scientists and pharmaceutical companies. We'll probably just listen to them. And I hate to say this. I've worked at the FDA. There's a lot of incompetence just even within regulators that you just think, oh, my God, you know, these people are at the FDA. Uh, they, they should know what they're talking about. But, but they bought it, you know? And so they, they, they bought this idea that there was no difference, even though, I mean, newsflash, and, you know, if you have a drug that's meant to be reducing depressive and anxiety symptoms, you should have clearly seen a decrease in suicidal thoughts and behavior on the group on the drugs. That, you know, just the fact that you didn't see that should have been suspicious already, you know? Um, why isn't this translating to, you know, reduce suicide? And so having thought about this kind of deeply for some time, I mean, there's, you know, most people intuitively understand that people can have unexpected reactions to drugs. You know, I always think about a group of friends sit together, they're smoking a joint and, you know, four out of five people are laughing, you know, they're enjoying it. And one person becomes paranoid and they go, this, this is not for me. Marijuana is bad for me. I don't like it. And so people know that drugs don't suit everyone the same. Mm -hmm. And so a much more you know, I think a much more plausible narrative would have been like, okay, so there's no difference on the group who's taking this drug that's meant to be able to make people feel better. So what this means, and really what I think this means is, okay, so there may be a group of people, you know, where it does make them less suicidal, but there may be a group of people where it makes them more suicidal. And if those two groups cancel each other out, you're going to get this, this reading that there's no difference. But 
Mm. That I'm think I mean that's always the you know if any scientist worth worth their salt should have been able to see that, but because there's such a capture of the academic literature by these groups that have a lot of you know scientists and money, they were able to spin a story that was saying don't trust the evidence before your eye, your own eyes. We have the statistics, and they successfully were able to do that for like 15 years, um, and they and they still kind of do it to this day. They they mm -hmm. say oh it's controversial, you know this is a controversial warning, you know the jury is still out. Yeah. Um, it's like what they did with smoking for a long time, and I think um, I mean it really just goes to show the power, you know the the, the power that you know, money and, you know, pumping out like, uh, articles and news pieces and things like that can, can have. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I like to now call everything that you just explained. Cause again, I didn't know, um, this, but I call it the spider web of influence. So this is part yeah. of, as I'm putting pieces together, like realizing, wait, doctors aren't like they don't learn how the system works and like science and all you know I mean they do but like how the FDA works like in med school and then I find out like wait academic institutions can be controlled by you know pharmaceuticals the companies the money's flowing in even if you look at like the 2004 meta-analysis when they who did the FDA use to look at it they didn't, weren't curious what was happening over in the UK, right? And David Healy and all his work um, that was happening there. They hired Columbia University to do it, which has a lot of pharmaceutical funding, right? And so, like, it, it was independent. Like, they weren't interested in, like, it was only a specific groups of people that they were actually yeah. having do the analysis. And I would think, again, I'm an advertising marketing background. So to me, I know the power of spin. And I also know the power of like when we design campaigns and we need to go do research with, uh, you know, consumers to see if they understand the message, et cetera. I know that you can fix groups. I know you can create the, the science to get the narrative that you need it to be. And ultimately, I think what I found is the FDA, like to me, at the end of the day, it was still simple to you, even if you don't want to get into like all the science and what you just did. If you got these two groups, like, why wouldn't you warn? Like, I never understood, like, why didn't you warn? Like, and the big thing at, at that time was everybody was afraid of saying, oh, if you put the warning on, it'll scare people from taking their medicines. But I'm like, wait, but then we would have had it. All these people would have had a chance, like warning and information will never, ever be a bad thing. But like you, FDA, you, the system is keeping very important information, not only from patients, but also our doctors that we trust. Hey, just want to interrupt quickly and just say if you're enjoying the content that we're producing here, that you consider liking, subscribing, and commenting on the videos. These are the type of things that gets this video kind of pushed to broader audiences and it can really help us. It's it's crazy, and and I know you saw firsthand, you know where these where these ideas come from, uh, because that I mean that was something that I heard a lot in my training. I, I I try and pinpoint the exact place where I, you know where where this began, um, but it's you 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 end up having the sense that by talking about the risks of the medication, gosh, you're somewhat dangerous. You're a dangerous person, um, and. You know, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about your thoughts on where that where that came from, because I know this was in the medical literature, but you've seen you've seen patient groups and you've seen uh, people come forward and I think say, say similar things. So, so yeah, what's your what's your take on that? You know, this idea that talking about risks is somewhat dangerous, and you know, we should hide. You know, we should not publicize them too much. Yeah, well, it's. Again, when I look back, it's just information. And to me, it's what gives, because ultimately, as of even a physician given somebody, we take it on an individual basis, right? We take a medication on an individual basis. And it goes to your point of like, you know, five people smoking marijuana, four are fine, and one gets completely crazy. Um, that is, same thing exists. It's just information. So that I don't understand that concept of scaring us. It's, it puts the, I mean, I understand it from a business standpoint. I understand it from like, 
But at the end of the day, wouldn't you want people to be empowered? Like I would think you'd want your patient, your family, your loved one to be empowered. And so the, but now I can understand like the doctors or to you when you were just saying that, um, that you're almost being gaslit, like, well, this isn't what the literature says and this isn't this, like, and it puts that, like, oh, is there's that hierarchy with the doctors and the whole system? Well, yeah. So, I mean, I always used to hear this and I, and I think a lot of doctors heard this as well, um, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy of evidence, you know, and down at the bottom of the hierarchy, you have expert opinion and anecdotes or case reports. And then, and then it kind of pyramids up and then it's like, okay, case control, a cohort study. And then right at the pinnacle, you have the randomized controlled trial, you know, and, and so you should only trust stuff that comes from the randomized control trial. And, you know, okay, so who controls the randomized control trials? You know, it's the, the companies that the have company. the funds to run them in the way they want to. And then they, they will say that, you know, anything that comes from that is the most trustworthy. But what the doctors don't realize and what the students don't realize is the randomized controlled trials are never really designed to pick up safety problems. Mm -hmm. You know, they're designed to test efficacy. And that's why you can have things like suicides being hidden in the studies because, you know, they cancel each other out. If you have a group that's saved and you have a group that's hurt, you know, if you just look at the outcome at the end, it's, it's a wash. You know, you've got things moving You've got your outcomes moving in different directions, both caused by the drug. It's not going to pick up that nuance. But the, but the, I remember hearing this again and again and again during my training. Yeah, you know, the, these are just a few case reports. Really, we have to look at the best quality data and that's randomized control trials. But they had no idea. I mean, they really were dilettantes. I think, they, I think a lot of my professors and a lot of people think that they understand clinical research and drug safety. But but they don't, and then they 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 allow themselves to be manipulated by, uh, you know, pharmaceutical spin. And and you made the point before where there's like, oh yeah, I see the marketing downside, but then why wouldn't you want patients to know? And that's exactly what it was. It's like with the drug companies, you know, they want to say this is not real. Don't even think about it. This is controversial. This is. Scientology propaganda or this is propaganda by a group of people who just want you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps because they don't want the family medicine physician out there to start having these questions when they're prescribing it. They want them to feel comfortable. They want them to think it's not real. Don't, don't need to worry about it. But really, it isn't in the best interest of patients. No. Um, and I, so, yeah, the, the, there's the two sides. It is. And I remember, yeah. so it's funny because I saw it play out and I've seen it play out in other hearings where you'll have one group and even at, like at the antidepressant hearings in 2004 and then the adult ones in 2006, there were families, you know, you had both sides you, or you had the professional people. And then I started learning about the organizations behind them, who funds them, who's their messengers. And so it was like patients who were maybe being funded because they came through one of the Na National Alliance for Mentally Ill or um, one of the suicide support groups, um, mental health groups. And, you know, you look that they were brought out, paid for their travel, but they say they have no outcome for the thing. They're just wanting you to know that this medication saved my life. Well, okay, this, sure. this, medication, this medication killed my kid, right? Okay, you've got mm -hmm. both of these. Everybody wants to talk about the anecdotes of it working, right? But that's just anecdote too. So if you want to go back to mm -hmm. the, you know, the top um, of your pyramid, mm -hmm. you're accepting the anecdotes that it saves. We're also saying that there's the anecdotes where it kills or it has impacted or harmed somebody, right? So like it's this, I've started to, at this time also seeing something where it's selective, kind of selective narrative that you want to buy into and which one you get promoting. And then when you start seeing all the, the, the messengers, you know, I've learned so many concepts that through this 20 years, um, you know, like I was just saying, the, the advocacy groups, who's behind them? And of course they're going to come, in some ways they become extensions of the marketing department because they're spewing the same message. And at the end of the day, I don't like the, the, you know, the FDA, the, you know, shareholder, the 
FDA is their job is to, to, you know, I mean, I think we think that it's to look at safety and efficacy, et cetera, but it's really there. The, that's how you get your drug on the market. It has to go through a regulatory process, right? And companies, their, their goal and their um, responsibility is to the shareholders. It's not actually to patients or the doctors. Like, I mean, as a Mm -hmm. business, and again, I come from a marketing business background, so I see it that way, but I don't, I still at the end, why wouldn't you, like, it helps everybody. It helps your reputation. It helps the idea that even like getting societal um, belief system that does everybody need a pill for everything, right? Is there something like that? Or, but I don't know, it just... It plays into that whole thing where th- we should have information and we should as patients and doctors, because one of the things that one of the documents that, again, that we got discovered showed how far, um, Pfizer, Chief Medical Officer Roger Lane wrote an entire article that talked about akathisia and the drug side effect akathisia, which I'd never heard of it, Right. But what was interesting, that was not, that was, of course, anybody could read. It was in some like psychiatry journal, but it was, it was the memo that he, um, that he issued to the sales staff that said the attached journal article explaining akathisia, um, is not suitable for general practitioners, but may be of interest to neurologically inclined psychiatrists. And so in that article, he talked, if a patient got akathisia, it, quote, unquote, death can be a welcome result. And it said it's less about it being distressing um, of the disease, but more the impact of what akathisia is, right? So here Mm -hmm. you have somebody who's talking about what akathisia is and says death could be a welcome result if a patient gets it, but yet you're telling the um, sales staff that it's not suitable for general practitioners. And yet the mm-hmm. bulk of these drugs are written by GPs. Which and, is like stupid, right? Because yeah, like, I mean, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you actually care, you'd say, okay, how do we get this article that has this useful information about this behavioral, you know, psychiatric problem the drug causes and let's, let's, let's bring it to a level where it could be used by a family medicine doctor. You know, something that's going to be, you know, easy to digest and understand. I mean, they can do all of these things, um, but they choose not to. And I I mean, this, a lot of this reminds me of my time in pharma. I I think I told you, you know, I, I worked at, I worked at Janssen on Spravato, but then I also had a few other drug safety roles and, um, you know, PR in a pharmaceutical company, the department's called medical affairs, you know, they kind of dress it up, but essentially it's, it's a PR for journals and conferences and things like that. But, and this, and this really kind of clued me in into something that was really interesting that I didn't understand for a long time about how the narrative is controlled. You know, once you get a drug on the market and the FDA has done the label, done the labeling, you know, the oversight, in terms of what the dr- drug companies put out into journals and into the public domain, it, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like over. I mean, they're, they're boxed in, in, in some respects, but you could essentially publish like a hundred articles touting the benefits or, you know, interesting neurological findings that seem to suggest some like brain improvements or maybe another population that some other academic, you know, who you've like secretly funded, you know, is using it for a different indication and, oh, this is kind of promising. You can, you can pump out all of this stuff. But I remember like being in the drug safety department, you know, for, for drugs. And I'm not going to mention which company this was, but, you know, there, there was some pretty serious problems out there. And, you know, in the safety department, we were saying, you know, this really deserves its own manuscript, you know, because these problems are going to come up and, you know, we've really learned how to treat them. And we should we should make this manuscript available for people so when when they're using the drug, if these things come up, they know how to do it. And it was shot down by the um, the the CMO at the time. He was saying, you know, listen, you know, we've got enough of this in the drug label. Doctors don't even know how to find drug labels on on the FDA website. They don't know how to do this. It's in the label, and and their words were uh, his words was, um, we don't want to make a bigger deal out of this than it is. 
you know? And so it's like, we can make a huge deal about the benefits and kind of go to town on it. But, you know, in terms of making a manuscript about safety, you know, or, or, or you know, putting on a, a talk about uh, the safety of this drug, that's going to kind of maybe make people think a bit more carefully, like, you know what, maybe this drug is not suitable for someone that has, you know, one of these, you know, a condition where a side effect would be bad for it. They, they, they didn't want to talk about it at all. And I think that happens all of the time, you know, that, you know, after, after the drug is on the market, it's just benefits and, and it's not about, um, giving a fair handed perspective on the drug. It's about positioning the drug in the most favorable light and, and that's it. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I always say, and my patient safety people do not like when I say this, I go, we're not patients, we're customers. And I think, and it's a business, healthcare is a business. And I think we have to remember that. And I say that because patience is how you go to, that's how you get your business. So if you, you want people in that market, like, you know, you want people, it's, you need the patients. You need, so if you told people and you're at that, like, especially like using the antidepressants and making it the narrative as, oh, these are safe and, you know, you've got test anxiety, this will help. Oh, you're a little, sa-. like having the real conversations of like, oh, wait, maybe some of this is just life. Like, oh, you had a breakup? Well, you're going to get through the breakup, right? You, you know, all of the things, like if you're trying to sell it to be work for everything or be fine for it or like there's no downside to it and you're not telling them all the downsides you know at the end it's still like and I will never understand it because I don't care people can take whatever they want but I think you have to give us Mm -hmm. information and we have to have the the informed information and if we have balanced information then I can have a conversation Or, you know, Woody could have a conversation, somebody's parent can have a conversation with the doctor and say, is it really the right thing we should do right now? You know, I mean, here's the side effect. Or if somebody calls in and talks about, um, you know, like head outside the body or I can't stop moving or what's going on and the doctor doesn't know or I'm having like all these crazy hallucinations and dreams and the doctor doesn't know. The doctor doesn't know who we trust, right? The patient. Mm-hmm. And they're going to think, oh, it's your disease because they've been kind of gearing and being trained. It's your disease getting worse. So we might want to layer something or, oh, you've been on this antidepressant for more than six weeks. Oh, we've, we've tried two of them. Well, maybe we should put Abilify on top of it. And then it, that starts this whole spiral versus if we had the information and our doctor. So going back to that akathisia. Um, it's why one of my friend's organizations, they're missed. That's all after her husband died. Um, mm-hmm. I said, if I were you, I, there's a side effect that nobody knows what it's even called, akathisia. Now you do and the psychiatrists do, but like the average mm-hmm. doctor has no idea what akathisia is. And so had Pfizer, when they talk, and that was not just Pfizer, that was the whole medical, um, the SSRIs talking about, because they were talking about because it was really talking about fluxetine, um, Prozac, had they talked, they could have done an entire education campaign on what akathisia is. Now, imagine mm-hmm. they would have done a campaign and like the drug, and it sounds like you're saying as somebody in the drug safety, as you know, your examples, like you, that could have been, you raised flags and I'm sure other people have raised flags because I think there's a lot of really good people in these companies um, and the FDA that do, you know, that want to do the right thing or think they're doing the right thing. But that is like, in my mind, like what a great opportunity. I know that those two don't go together because one makes money. One may, you might not have as many people buying your, you know, your product or prescribing it, or the doctor might say you might want to do exercise first or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things I get, but I just don't get it from a human, like human to human yeah, I mean, I think money and ambition gets in the way, you know, and because I think it, I mean, it's hard to, I'm, I'm going to try and explain what it's like to be an executive in a drug company. I haven't heard, ha- held an executive level position there, but I've been in a lot of conversations. Um, um, and okay, so you're, let's say you're a new antidepressant or you're like 
or, or something like that. And you're coming onto the market and there's, it's a crowded field and you're saying, okay, so we have some marginal benefit, you know, we have an edge, you know, we cause less sexual dysfunction or something like that. <laughs> and then you have, but you have a new side effect, right? And, and you go, so I really want people to be able to manage this side effect. I really want to help people with this, but I don't want people to associate that with my drug because, you know, you know like it's, it's, it's a different side effect than those in the other profile. So maybe we'll just kind of put this in the label. We're not going to say much about it. We're not going to run this campaign because, because here's what, ha- here's what's, what happens. And, and this has happened before. Um, if your drug, like if, if you're entering a crowded marketplace and your drug gets associated with some kind of risk that makes a doctor just go, oh, you know what? I really don't want to have to deal with that. I, they're going to go with another drug. And it's essentially, it's, you know, it can be, these are hundreds of millions of dollars or lost or sometimes billions. And probably the most widely known example of this was Geodon, which is one of the newer atypical antipsychotics, uh, which everyone knows is associated with prolonged QTC. This is a heart arrhythmia problem. Um, and, you know, Geodon is hardly prescribed as much as olanzapine and, and things like Abilify because of that. And so when, when your drug gets identified as having a more serious side effect, you know, you want to hide that as, as much as possible because people will just choose another product. And so you have these people in companies in positions of power and they're just saying, okay, um, this is an issue we want to let people know, but if I let people know, this is going to potentially tank, tank the company. You know, we're going to have to fire people. We're going to lose money for research and development. We might have to shut down a whole wing of clinical trials and send those people home. And so they're in this position where they're, you know, they, they have been given the responsibility to navigate the corporate seas skillfully and kind of, you know, you know, get, make the company successful and that corrupts people. It, it corrupts them away from, from the mission and they, and, and companies will always tell you, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. My our commitment is to the people that we serve is to the patients. And that's going to be on all of the slogans and all of the walls in the company. But at the end of the day, that that's why that person is in that position. You know, they're, they're there to expertly navigate those corporate seas and, 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 and guide the company to, to financial success. Well, uh, and, and, and they will get away with as much as they as they can. Okay, yeah. so I'm listening to you. My remember, my whole background is advertising and marketing. Yeah. I've spent, you know, that I mean, I've worked on all the big brands, BMW, never pharmaceuticals. But so what you're saying is exactly what we help our clients figure out. How do we mm-hmm. give us the competition, like the competitive advantage? Okay, we want to downplay this. Okay, all right, so our speed is a little less than the Mercedes because I did all the BMW for years. And so we knew how to take and manip- you know, basically position because it's sales. And yeah. so that, I mean, so that also is like in a unique perspective, I think, that I have as a lens because I've spent my entire, I still am in that business. And so, again, it's when I heard you just explaining it. Yeah, I mean, that's what you should do. If you're in marketing, like that's what you're doing. And even as a business, if you're like even the operations manager, everybody's thinking about, okay, what is the benefit? Because that's what you want to sell. Like that's, that's why you're in the business. And what's the competition, like what's your competitive advantage over your, you know, your competition? And so mm-hmm. you see it, but the, the difference is, and you know, I've done so many like testimonies before the FDA when they were doing things on advertising and marketing. They had a whole thing on uh, direct to consumer hearings. There was one on social media. There was one on how to communicate. Like I've been at all of these. And I remember like saying, it is not, we are practicing, the, you are practicing the same kind of techniques as the Cokes. And the, you know, the um, car companies, you're, and the Nike, the shoe companies, you're using the same techniques, but these are going into people's bodies and we have to work and we have to consider it at a different standard of, you know, there's an ethical standard of the, somebody's taking it. And so, you know, when you look at the whole, and I, and, I, and I go back to even like the lawsuit of harms, like if somebody should get harmed, right? I mean, I think 
if harms or an injury or, you know, somebody dies, there's always like, that's already factored into things. They know there'll be people that are harmed. There are people, it goes into, it's like there. And then, then it's all about how do you keep the lawyers from getting, doing their job so that these people can't get into discovery and into the courts. So this is constant tension at every level it's ultimately a business and you know that's where even but we want to help it's in the guys like we need doctors like i need the system when we're sick right and the doctors need it too because there has to be tools but like can't we figure out a way to do it ethically like I'm not putting sales first. Like I just, like I say that I just want. I mean, so I, I guess the question is, it's it's also just like, I mean, if it really is that, you know, if if, if really what we want to do is arm doctors with the best information to treat patients, it's like, why do you need a marketing and like a marketing department for a pharmaceutical company? You know, it's it, it they 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 counter. You know what what the what the two things do, but. You know, this is America. You know, there's love it or hate it. There's, 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 it's a very capitalist country. You know, there's huge investment in pharmaceuticals and tech and all of these things, and it's skewed towards business prosperity. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we have more drugs. You know, we have more research and development. There's all these things that go along with it, but, um, that would be very un-American, I think, to, 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 to lose. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm not like being uh, Pollyanna, yeah. but I also yeah. get and understand it's yeah. business. Like, it yeah. is what we do. And, you know, when you look at advertising and marketing, like advertising in itself, like the U.S. is one of two countries that allows drug ads, right, on air. And I know they're trying yeah. to get it in other countries, but... What that does, and I see it personally with even in my industry now, the only companies that are really spending the big dollars are pharmaceutical companies in advertising campaigns. And so what that does is it also creates the, um, where like a lot of the industries, you know, the cottage industries that support ad campaigns, like directors mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the crews, the stylists, the, the models, the talent agents, the ad agencies, they all want it too because it's part of their bread and butter business as well. Oh, it's, yeah, they're enormous. Yeah, um, it's enormous. And so. Yeah. Yeah, I think about, you know, Zoloft's interesting because, I mean, Zoloft was, was, was Woody's drug. And I think Zoloft has the most interesting marketing campaign and, and you know, with the blob, I'm sure you're familiar yeah. of like the depressed blob that yep. kind of bounces along and it says at the end of it, it's like, you know, some doctors believe that depression may be caused by low levels of serotonin, you know? And it's like, you know, marketing is so, uh, it's so interesting, you know, how they choose to sell drugs because the whole chemical imbalance thing was, you know, it, it it was it was a marketing campaign that wanted to treat depression as if it was like diabetes. You know, mm -hmm. like we, you know, in diabetes we understand you have low insulin. We're just going to rebalance your insulin levels and you'll be fine. And and they wanted depression to be like that because then it could just be this drug that's easily used without a lot of thought for any kind of depression. And 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 you think about yeah, okay, so what would have been the more helpful message for patients at the time? You know it would probably have been something like this, you know, these drugs ca can cause a degree of emotional constriction that may be therapeutic, you know, not all of these effects may be benefit beneficial in all aspects of your life. And there are, you know, there's a number of people who, who may actually have uh, worsening because of it. I mean, that would have been the message, but God, that would have, that would have caused a lot of doctors to think, ah, oh, you know what? I don't think I'm comfortable doing that. That sounds like a lot of time to monitor the varied effects of this drug. That's a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm going to leave it to the psychiatrist. And they didn't want that. They wanted something that would, could have been, that was easy to understand and could be thought of like insulin for diabetes. And it's just, and, and, and people think like, how on earth could an ad like that go onto the market? You know, it must be true. How could a drug company, you know, you know, how could the government let people air an ad like that and kind of pump out those ideas? How could doctors let this happen? How could, you know, how could the news and, you know, the advertising let it happen? And they go, it must be true, but it's just, um, 
I mean, yeah, I, I think I think when something really bad happens to you, and and you and you fall victim to one of these things, you realize there's so many holes in the system. People are asleep at the wheel, and they're not really protecting people. They're letting these dangerous ideas get out there about drugs, and it's it's marketing. It's just marketing, and yeah. so one of the other things. So I realize there's so many aspects of marketing that are more than just the consumer piece, right? Which is the ads, because I think that also helps prime us. And you remember doctors. People who are giving these drugs are also consumers, too, because they're sitting watching Sunday night football or whatnot, right? So sure. they see it and they're being marketed. But when I started to learn about key opinion leaders, um, which is really where you know the companies pay these doctors to go out and do speeches and put their names on things or help develop tools, which it, all in good, I mean, it sounds like it's a good thing, but if you actually go and look at the companies or even ghostwriting and all of that, that's where, you know, some of the ghostwriting things, I, I had no idea about ghostwriting. And one of the, again, this was one of the things that came out from the documents. And then I started going deep is that mm -hmm. there were articles, like there was an entire document that talked about the publication strategy. So which articles were going to run for what disease? It was social anxiety disorder for, um, pros or for Zoloft. It had all of, they knew exactly when they were running what the content was, and then there were a couple things that said author TBD. They still didn't have an author, but they already knew that it was going to run, when it was running, what it was about, but it still said author TBD. So they had not put an author on there yet. And so it was already written by, there's companies yeah. that once you go in, and you probably already know all this, but like the, you know, this was something that I learned that their company, they're, it's, a mar it's a marketing strategy. And you go look at these companies and the way they go out and market to their companies, to their customers and, you know, biotech companies and, and even like advocacy, the patient advocacy organizations and going out and finding those really good patients, especially now that we're in the world of social media and getting nano influencers and the micro influencers. Oh my God. You know, it's, yeah. it is a business. We work with one of them that does nothing but nano. So they have small, their companies and they know they create councils. And so I understand like from that perspective, that's just going into the, like, that's just the business side of the marketing of it. Right. I, th I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's it's hard to know just how good these companies are at what they do um, unless you're on the inside because you know when I when I was developing drugs at some of the companies um, uh, yeah you work with a lot of the key opinion leaders because those are the people that um, run the clinical trials um, usually out of academic sites sometimes it's in big clinical trial sites but you often you want to pick key academics in different countries because you also want their support you want them to be familiar with it so when it comes to drug launch they could do conferences locally and they can talk to other doctors and so you kind of you, you want to grab a bunch of these key academics who they're, they're biological psychiatrists that's what they do they're interested in that I, I you know there may not be something kind of evil with all of that it's just that they're going to pick people who are established and who like it and they're going to get them the drug to run the study while you're developing the drug, um, you have um, medical science liaisons and, and people that keep in touch with these doctors and they go, hey, just based on the clinical trial results that you're seeing and, and, you know, and they share it with them, you know, what are the biggest concerns that you have about this drug? What are the safety concerns? Um, what are the things that you wonder? And then so they'll generate a whole list of these things like, hey, this doctor, is re he's really worried about... Um, <clears throat> he's really worried about rash or, you know, this doctor's really worried about infertility problems on the drug. And so they use those list of questions to generate articles, just like the ones that you were saying. And it's like, Hey, we need to contextualize this infertility issue. And, and essentially what that means is, you know, put it in context, but it's like, we're going to downplay it. You know, we, we already are anticipating that doctors are going to be worried about this when they want to prescribe the drug. So, we're going to get a conference on this. We're going to get some, we're going to get three articles out, out on this. And, and, you know, in this panel of people who look at the drug, there's going to be these natural kind of arguments that come up. Like one doctor's like, it's not a big deal. The other doctor's like, it is that they just grab the doctors who say, you know, infertility is not a big deal. That's author TBD. Hey, help us with this article. And they get that guy who's favorable, who has a reputation and that's author TBD. And then, and they put him on it. And so, I mean, 
they're just good at what they do, you know, and, and it's kind of what you would expect from any company that has billions of dollars and uh, essentially, uh, you know, their their survival is dependent on selling selling the drugs. And, right. and a lot of doctors don't realize that, but that's that that's that's how it happens. Yeah, well, and I would go back, and I think we've talked about this on the last time, but even one of the screening forms, you know, the PHQ-9 form that is used, which is the depression, you know, in the last mm-hmm. two weeks, have you felt sad? Have you ate too much? You know, in that whole, that, I mean, so when I really learned about that screening tool and at the bottom, you know, it says a generous donation by Pfizer and three doctors. Well, th- two of them have been big doctors in litigation against um, the companies that the, they were representing the company's narrative, right? And so they were part of, so they're key opinion leaders. But when I saw that mm-hmm. screening tool and I was like, what is, I go, this kind of reminds me of, you know, one of my clients was Land's End and Land's End is a catalog, you know, they're a clothing company yeah. in the Midwest, right? And they've never used an outside ad agency before, but they said, we want you to go and get us all new people up here. And they described it as a funnel, Right. And so get the people to go into the funnel. And then once they're in the funnel, meaning the catalog, we, we've got them there. Or mm-hmm. BMW would say, go out, get all the people up here, and get them as soon as they get into the seat. So get them to consider us. But as soon as they, we get the butts in the seat, we know that we can sell the BMW or whatever, the car. So this mm-hmm. tool is a sales tool. It's a funnel. And so it brings all these people because everybody at the, um, they figured out how to get it and under the guise. And so I think a lot of things actually start out in, you know, with the good intentions or somebody's like, hey, this is a good thing to use because we can start having conversations about people's mental health at the doctors. So now every doctor, like in a lot of the system wide around the country, you have to, when you fill out your, you know, like, is this your insurance? Anything changed from last time you were here? You mm-hmm. have this, um, this form that's part of your just everyday kind of filling out. And then you have to then bring that form into your doctor. But what it does is it gives it, I mean, I get it from a, it's a really easy tool. Like, oh, I see that you've, you know, your numbers are down or they're really high. But then it's like what happens from there and you know what happens from there. It's successful. That's why they do it and it yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. So this is, I guess, yeah, the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 are probably in the majority of these, these family medicine things. And I, and I think it's worth, I'm, I'm going to walk through the spider web because I think this is a nice place to kind of show how everything links together. Like, okay, so you have a drug company that, that, chooses you know they're going to choose patient organizations to support and it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with that you know dbsa nami all these different groups and they're going to fund them to go out and talk about mental health problems to politicians and and then you're going to see things in the news about you know depression is under recognized under diagnosed all of these things and so you have this political pressure that trickles down to uh, insurance companies usually and, and different or, or, or healthcare organizations. And then they say, guys, guys, are you seeing the news? Like there is a mental health epidemic going on and we are underdiagnosing people and, and we really need to up our game because, you know, now this is coming down politically and you know, maybe there's more programs for it. And so they say, well, how do we do that? And then Pfizer comes along and says, well, actually, we have this PHQ-9 and we have this GAD-7, you know, depression and anxiety is really common. You could just easily kind of fit this in before you sit down and see the patient and it's a good screening tool. That doesn't seem like a bad idea, whatever, you know, this, this, this is nice. Um, and so then they fill it out and they start talking about, um, yeah, so they can talk about depression. But then at this point, you know, the drug companies, because, you know, through their key opinion leaders and their capture of the medical literature, they've already convinced doctors mostly that depression, it's, you know, mostly like a chemical problem or it's something to be treated by these safe and effective drugs. And, and they're just, they're, they're just primed. Like you said, you know, we all know what happens then because none of these things would have been a problem if they go and talk to the doctor and they say, Hey, we have this drug, 
you know, we don't really want to use it for too many people because there's a lot of risks, but let's get you plugged in with really good counseling and social support and we're really going to help you. I mean, most people know that's not the system that, that we have. You know, we have a system that dispenses drugs. And so, yeah, you're right. It, it, it's a funnel. That, mm-hmm. that's, 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 that's how it happens. And it funnels people into a system that dispenses drugs. And that's why drug companies spend so much money developing these tools and funding these groups. You know, they're not stupid. You know, they're, they're, there's, a, there's an ROI on it that's clear. Right. And it also like looks good for them. Sometimes it just looks like great publicity. Oh yeah, you're really helping these groups and uh, you're developing these tools for people. But it's like there's, there's an agenda behind it. There is. And that I think at the end of the day, obviously, this is the kind of conversation what you just explained, right? I mm-hmm. started learning, you know, I've gone to all kinds of conferences all over the world that are critical thinking. And one, what, you know, like healthy skepticism, uh, there was one Bright Care Alliance, and then the one I went to call, um, called Selling Sickness in Amsterdam in 2010 was put on by the Dutch government and uh, attended by people from all over the, e- um, the EU and, and Australia and all over. But only a handful of us, like 10 of us, were from the U.S. And every example that they were using was from the U.S. And it was about our marketing and it was the selling, it was the disease mongering, it's the, you start advertising a disease and then lo and behold, a couple months later, there's an ad, you know, surprise, there's a pill that's gonna, but they've already primed the market, right? And I remember talking to the organizers and I said, why are you having this conference in the U.S.? And they're like, "Eh, it's not our place. So I eventually brought a conference called Selling Sickness to the U.S. in 2013. And so I've been on this whole like marketing because, again, it goes back to my background, but it's kind of connecting all the dots in the spider web. But I went and presented this. I was invited to give uh, a talk to Washington, Wash U Med School uh, this past, earlier this, um, this year. And I talked a lot about the whole, everything just from my experience from a lev- advocacy lens, but also my marketing and all that. And I had two doctors afterwards, two chairs come up to me and said, we never have heard, we don't hear this. And I could tell they both had accents. And I'm like, and I said, this is the first time we have heard this kind of conversation in our school, because I brought up all the stuff we're talking about right now, just like how it works. And like the doctors need to be educated on this. So when they go they can actually know how to deflect a little bit and know, be a little bit smarter so they're not susceptible because ultimately, it, you know, if we want to help, because I think people do go into med school thinking they want to help people, oh, right? Yeah. That's the whole reason. Like, you're not, there, you're not out there to be bad, you know, do evil. And, and so anyways, both of them had accents. And I said, let me guess, where are you from? And um, one was from the, U, you know, the UK and the other one was from like Germany. And I was like... Yeah, because we don't talk about it in America. And so this, your little bit should absolutely be part of helping to educate. Like this should be the conversations that are happening at med schools. And we know that the influence, we know the money, we get it. But how do you reach people with what you just said? Because you're not only a psychiatrist, you've, um, you've been inside the companies, you've been at the FDA, uh, you've seen it, right? But this is the conversation that we need to help also educate doctors. And, you know, I'm out there doing the public as much as I can, but. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, you're making me think really about what my experience was like in residency. Um, and it really starts there, you know, that, yeah, we, we do go in wanting to help people. And, um, you know, for a lot of, for a long time looking back at it, I mean, I was just harming people, you know, uh, you know, when I was in residency, I was practicing in a way that was completely wrong. Um, and when I look at, I mean, academia in the U S has, you know, they, they, it kind of has a, especially in psychiatry, kind of like this unholy alliance, you know, with the pharmaceutical industry, because the way you know, the, the hierarchy structure in, um, 
in academic institutions is, you know, you, you kind of work your way up to becoming like a tenured professor and then eventually a chair. And that is, and you're evaluated based on your publications and your, and your, and your, and your research, right? And the most valuable um, research that someone can do is uh, clinical trials. It's like if you have run clinical trials for like a new condition, you can generate like six or seven or eight publications. Um, you know that they're going to be um, accepted in top tier journals with high impact factors because, I mean, you're not publishing them on your own. Usually these are, these are clinical trials sponsored by drug companies and, and you're recruiting patients from your institution. And so you have you know, you have a writer or a ghost, you know, a ghost writer who's going to put the draft together. Um, you know, you have like a publication team who's going to harass like New England Journal of Medicine or who, or Lancet or any of these top tier groups. And so they kind of make it very easy for you to churn out like eight publications and get them into top tier journals because it's a well-oiled machine. I mean, there's contracting groups that that's all they do. They get publications into high impact factor journals. And so what this does um, in a in a residency in a training program is the elite within there are, are all industry. I mean they they've essentially become industry friendly. You know their their career progression and the speed at which they kind of go up is, is really linked to uh, um, clinical trials from drug companies and and so the people that go to the top are the people that are more of these biological psychiatrists. They're more interested in that part of it. And that's fine. You know, you, you can be more inclined in that way. That doesn't mean you're bad or anything, but it becomes completely unbalanced, you know? And so when you're a young doctor and you're just like, okay, you know, that's, this is the leadership. They're all very biological. When they come and talk to you, they're talking about, you know, PS. PTSD, I mean, they're not talking about it from a psychotherapeutic perspective. They're talking about the chemical changes in the brain and the exciting new advancements and the new drug therapies. And so you kind of just, you, you marinate in this soup of like biological, biomedical model, you know, these are the treatments and, and, and these are the leaders um, uh, of, of your group. And, that's, and I think that's really where it starts. I mean, it's just indus it's industry friendly doctors who are mostly biological training the training the psychiatrists because that's that because that's how they get money and you, and you need money you need clinical trial stuff coming into the institutions to pay for researchers and salaries and things like that so yeah it's it, a, a lot of it is influenced by drug company money yeah absolutely but yeah. then so if, yeah. do you think since you are you were you know went through med school do you think having that information like what would be for not, I mean, I get it from all of what you say, you know, who's, who you're being married, you know, being taught by, or maybe marinated mm -hmm. in, but do you think to have that balance, right? Having this type of conversation so that we could, uh, that doctors coming into the field understand all of the potential possibilities that could ultimately hurt or help somebody, right? Do you think that there's a place for it? Or am I being, yeah. you know, like I feel like there still could be this counter because in my mind, science, right? Science is never established. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, like we've seen in the last couple of years, like it's this way, that's not. But science is a constant tension. It's teasing out. It's the balance, or at least... That's what I remember from um, what or what I think of science. So imagine you had a you, you know med school where you it doesn't mean you have to have a bunch of classes, but you should have like I I mean I was really happy that Wash U uh, somebody who ran their clinical trial department brought me in, and it was open to the whole med school, and I thought that was a really brave thing to do. And he was actually told that he was brave, and but yet it shouldn't be brave. I think, yeah, I think there really is a space for that. And um, especially if you do it in a, in a good way where you're not like, um, you know, shaming people for certain things because it is okay to be a biological psychiatrist. If that's your sure. jam, you know, you should be able to do it, but it needs to be balanced. And I, I do think that you can do and that, that it should be more open um, to these things because, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the program directors, you know, everyone there, I mean, they, they do want to, 
train people to to help patients out in the world they've just you know we've wandered into this 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 absolute mess and i think people don't know how to get out but i really think that that would be really really valuable um Mm -hmm. um and helpful just to you know highlight all of the things that we're just saying right now yeah i mean thank you for it's just i like our the conversation we've had because i think you offer a really good perspective and insight being that you've come from the companies have done that but you're also on the outside and then marrying those two experiences of my background and and you know the marketing and all the things that i've learned that i love learning and these kind of conversations and i think they're really important to have for the public yeah. as well you know we've we've covered a lot but there's one part we didn't cover which i think would be interesting is um is fda uh, because uh, you've had your run in with the FDA and I've had, and you know, I've been at the FDA before. And so I think, um, t- tell us more about that, you know, personal experience from being on these advisory committees and, and just your experience with like Bob Temple, Tom Loughran, uh, leaders, leaders at the FDA when, when you were there and you were advocating for I guess a lot of these drug side effect problems, which they ignored for several years and, and eventually couldn't ignore anymore. Like, I, th- I think that could be a, a, a fun place to pick up. Sure. Uh, yeah, it is yeah. Um, interesting. So I've been obviously working with the FDA for a long time and have been yeah. in there. My, my whole point is I want to make you better. You know, I don't go in there thinking get, you know, you hear people say, get rid of them. No, I want you to do it yeah. like part of your mission is public health, right? Or at least I think, you know, really looking at safety and efficacy. But what I have learned is that really safety always comes after the fact, right? And even just that experience of what, how long it took with antidepressants and how the FDA, you know, before they did warning, but they hadn't a, a chance, right? So there's this whole idea of pushing them and also like you know, learning the the same people who approve the drugs, why are they the ones that are also responsible for like monitoring the safety? And I've heard the same issues on safety for a long time, like with the the MedWatch, the now the VAR system, the FAIR system, the you know the device reporting system. That you know, for twenty years, I've heard the same thing by the FDA officials that. Uh, Oh, those are real world. We can't really trust those data. I'm like, yeah, but it's a signal. And also, Mm -hmm. if you really wanted to make safety a priority, you guys have the ability. I mean, you go ask and update the system so it actually gives you, because the technology is there. So I'm always in there, like on their side, um, or in their side, I should say, poking them for safety. And, you know, then I had the, so that was before I got on the committee. Then I got put onto the Psychopharmalogic Drugs Advisory Committee as a consumer rep. And it was a very interesting, it's definitely a very interesting place to sit because I'm still going to use my experience, like safety. I'm going to always say safety because I understand that we're trying to get drugs on the market. That's what you're doing but we got to talk about what is safety, where, how about long term, like what's going to come out, how are we going to make sure. But safety, actually, that was one of the insights. Safety really isn't really discussed. Like they bring it up, but then, I mean, you've been a part of these where you hear even when it comes time to vote. And I always tell people they should always listen to the advisory committees. Um, I think there's a couple places that are super interesting to listen to. Um, public, open public comments. I think it's just an interesting place to learn, like kind of almost guess who's going to say what, because of, you know, who they, you know, when they come from an organization, they almost always are saying pro, we need more tools in the toolbox, right? We need more drugs for our patients, patients, patients. And then on the advisory board, when it comes time um, to vote, I always say, listen to the explanation after the vote and hear what people have to say and why they voted. Many times you'll hear that I voted yes for the drug because I think we need it or whatever. I thought the evidence was, you know, Mm -hmm. the P-value, you know, whatever the reasons they give. But then if you hear 
they'll say, I don't know if that the safety is totally there, but we're going to have a REMS program. So it's always like kind of like assumed somebody is going to pick up the safety side of things. And so that was yes. one of my, you know, insights. And then the other one that's interesting is I also realized... I just want to say oh, quickly, yeah. so a REMS program for people who may not know, it's it's a, after the drug is on the market, it's a dedicated program to to investigating safety. It, it takes many different forms, but it could be like a, an additional study or something like that targeted at safety findings. Yeah, and it's... Yeah, but, but go and on. I was yeah. just saying, so most people just assume like, oh, yeah. the REMS program, like just so cavalier, you know, yeah. like, oh, it'll pick it up. <laughs> and so... But the other thing that I think is interesting is when you start looking at the type of people who are on the advisory board committees, you know, when we're talking about, like, I've always wondered, why aren't there real world, like a GP, when we're talking about these psychiatric drugs, why isn't there a real world GP practicing GP? Not an academic one, not, a G, not somebody who is a psychiatrist at the VA who also does all the clinical trials for the VA or gets, you know, they're with an academic institution. I feel like there needs to be real world, you know, because that is how these drugs are ultimately going to come out mm -hmm. and be played out is in real world. And so I thought, you know, I always think that's interesting. And I wonder, and I ask why there isn't somebody. And then I look at a lot of who is on there and I realized this concept of kind of self-censoring a little bit. Like, what if somebody really did want to actually say something about safety or maybe they didn't really want to vote? Like those ones that especially are like kind of, you know, bring up safety concerns in their explanation. But do they not because they're with an institution that gets funding from pharma? I don't know if this company that we're reviewing it or not, but just the idea, like, you don't want to seem like you're a critic of pharma. You want to be able to be more pro. I mean, that's why you see a lot of these advisory board members that do, you know, hold themselves back. And somebody like me, I don't, I will always have safety. I, you know, I've told the FDA I will, if you don't consider safety, like I'm going to assume, like I will, I've had drugs, I've had a couple of them. I'm not always a no vote. I've had some where the evidence really actually was there. Um, and so, you know, I did vote for the evidence, right? But for mm -hmm. the most part, um, I don't, like for me, my motivation is I just want something that's out there safe, like get it positioned right. I know the FDA, when I ask questions about marketing or I look at things about off-label, which was one of my drugs that I, because I do go look at how the companies, like what does CEO say? What does Wall Street say? Because that's where my background is. Yep. And, um, but the FDA also kind of, I do kind of get dismissed like, oh, here's that dumb girl who is going to bring up marketing. Mm -hmm. So anyways, so it's been a very interesting. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, picking up on what you said, you know, you know, why why wouldn't some people speak up if they were, I guess, elected to be um, a representative of the profession on one of these advisory panels, like a psychiatrist or something like that? Um, I think the influence kind of happens, like, it, I mean, it almost happens when you go through training. I mean, it's intimidating to be on these boards. I mean, this is something that you put on your resume, and it's it's. I mean, it's impressive, you know, yeah, I, I'm a psychiatrist and the FDA called me up to be an objective, um, you know, person, you know, assessing this drug. And so you go there and you're, and you're sitting next to the leaders in the field, you know, professor of this, chair of that. Again, these are the same people who have risen to their position of power because they're biological psychiatrists. They go to the same con conferences as industry. They sit through the same you know, the, 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 the same talks, most of which were funded by industry and generally have very positive spins on drugs. And so, yeah, so they're sitting on the boards with these people. Many of them have been trained by them. And, and what I think happens, and it, it, it's not a secret, I mean, it's, it's peer pressure to an extent, you know, and it's an experience that everyone can kind of relate to if you've been in any kind of corporate environment. Sometimes it's intimidating being up there and you just want to go with the flow. You don't want to seem too radical. You want to seem like a reasonable person. And 
and you and you're just reflecting on kind of the the statements that other people have made and the things that you've read in in articles and you know journals that you trust and you think are reputable and so i think they end up generally generally kind of just going with the status quo because it's um yeah and that that's not everyone but i will say that a lot of people out there are agreeable and they don't want to ruffle feathers and they don't want to look stupid in a public setting and so they're going to kind of just go with go with the group and i know there's a lot of like you know social like social sciences and psychology studies that have kind of really shown how powerful uh, peer pressure can be um so yeah yeah i th- i think that again you know that that's probably a pretty big reason why you know, you're, you're the one out there that's like, Hey, I'm really worried about these things. But, you know, a lot of people are coming back with much more muted and much more reserved, uh, positions. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I saw the real, I've lived the real world. So if, you know, and when I look at some of the, some of the controversial drugs that we had, like new you know, understanding that a lot of things are coming to the FDA using, um, um, unmet need, and breakthrough pathways that are something that are being done, you know, they can get in faster and with less data, et cetera. And so when I see that, that means that, oh, it's going to get approved on a small number, right? And you might have very few people in the trial, but it's really going to be what's going to, what is it going to look like when it's actually given to the millions of people, whatnot. And there was one drug the Nuplazid, which is for Parkinson's psychosis, and they had tried to get it approved twice before under the traditional way, and they didn't. And this was a make or break, and they were able to use an unmet breakthrough therapy, and they were able to revise the scale that they were using to, um, you know, look at the data. And there were it was a small number of people split between placebo and the group, and. Then you fast forward and there were a couple um, harms like um, and I remember saying I I didn't I voted no for it. And same with the Parkinson's patient who lives with this disease. Both of us voted no. And I remember saying, mark my words, this is going to come back to bite us. Sure enough, a couple years later, I get a call from CNN wanting to know why I voted no. And and they because they started looking into all the data that was in med that had been reported to MedWatch, and you watched that what happened, and I could have already. Pro- I mean, I already saw that happening, right? I could already see the um, what was going to happen because immediately after the advisory committee, it got um, press releases got put out breakthrough breakthrough for patients Parkinson's patients, so it sold hope, right? And under that word breakthrough. But breakthrough was actually, you know, was it really break for breakthrough or was it a breakthrough therapy designation, the pathway that they were able to use, right? But it got positioned as, oh, this is a great word for marketing. And so the patients, so there were some people in the CNN who were those patients that saw it as hope. And, you know, hope is powerful. And then Hope is not powerful after something happens, which it did with these couple families that were in this article. And so that's really how I take my role. I don't, I mean, I don't get, I don't get paid. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't make my, my living, my reputation, like it, it's not based on what I do. I just take my role really serious. And, you know, there needs to be people out there who who are really, who are really kind of, doing this role and are really kind of hopping on about safety because, you know, there, there is another thing that I wanted to touch on. You mentioned MedWatch. So MedWatch is the FDS, um, um, a safety database. You know, anyone can go online and they could submit a case safety report straight to the agency. And when I was in the division of psychiatry, um, I would get a lot of these reports yeah, coming, coming through. Um, and I would, do studies on, on these reports from the post-marketing setting as well. And I mean, one of the most interesting things that I noticed there was that there was so little emphasis on safety in terms of like the, the day-to-day actions of, of what was happening. 
I mean, the extent of safety was, you know, something would turn up in my inbox. It was like a report on a safety issue. I would just kind of look at it and then I would make a little comment in there about whether I had any questions for the company about what had happened in this report. The reality of being at the FDA is kind of interesting. So you are really busy and you're really busy not on safety issues. And so over time, when these safety reports are coming in, you kind of glaze over is the general the general feeling. You say, oh, yep, just going to kind of agree with what the, what the company is saying because it's it's a, it can be a lot of work to, to go and sort of chase, you know, go down these rabbit holes. Hey, ask this and ask this and do all of these things and then kind of sit and, and you know, wait for email correspondence back. And you have to kind of track all of these things. And so my general sense over time and also talking to colleagues was that these things were just glazed over really, really quickly so they could get back to their other tasks. Now, now what were those other tasks? The tasks that I mostly did and what most everyone does in the FDA, uh, yeah, not centered around safety. It's centered around drug evaluation. So there's two things you do. You review NDAs, which are new packets, uh, which are, which are clinical trial packets to get a drug on the market. And you re review something called INDs. And these are protocols when a company wants to uh, run a study. So they have to submit a protocol and you have 30 days to review it. And then they get to enroll their first patient. And you're essentially making sure it's safe. Now, why is it that, you know, we, we're meant to be these kind of unbiased people protecting the public health. Why is it that we are spending 95% of our time doing company focused activities, you know, getting, helping them get their drug on the market quickly, helping them run their trials quickly. And, and it all comes down to the PDUFA Act. You know, this was um, a, um, you know, this was an act of Congress that I, I don't know exactly when it came in, but essentially it was an in 1992, there we go. It was it was an act to get uh, the FDA f uh, better funded so they could hire more reviewers. And this came from the pharmaceutical companies because they were complaining that they would be submitting research to the FDA and the FDA would sit on it for like two years. And they're just saying, excuse me, my patent is expiring. Can you please review my dossier so I can market my drug? And the FDA would say, we don't have enough people. And so uh, Congress um, put together a way for the drug companies to actually fund FDA. You know, I think, you know, to give them millions and well, I guess probably billions of dollars to essentially hire new reviewers. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah, sure. Give the FDA more money so they can hire new reviewers. But there were a few st st stipulations in there and these were time limits. And it says, we're going to give you this money, but you need to review all of our new applications within 90 day, within within nine months, not a day later. Um, or else, you know, you know, you're not living up to your contract and you need to look at all of our pr clinical trial protocols within 30 days. Drug development has just grown and grown and grown in the US. And so there, there's more of these than ever coming in. And when you have something like the division of psychiatry with 15 reviewers for all of the research happening in the country, that's mostly what they're doing. And this is mostly what my boss used to, you know, care about was, are we on time? Are we on time? You know, are we, you know, making sure that we're, you know, meeting all of our metrics for these things? There, there are hardly any metrics. I mean, maybe there are, but none that I ever heard about for reviewing safety issues. And, and this is why you have things like David Healy's like PSSD, um, uh, citizens petition, just kind of sitting there for five years on the back burner somewhere saying, Hey guys, you know, PSSD is a thing, put it in the label. It's just kind of ignored somewhere. There's and uh, you know, still under review, but yeah, mo most of the medical officers at the FDA, they're, they're just, they're, they're reviewing clinical trials they're, and they're not going into the details of, oh, oh, what happened with this person in this study who became like agitated? Should I go and, you know, call the family and say, hey, was this normal behavior for this person? I, I you know, I noticed they became agitated and they were hospitalized. Let me, let me interview them. Let me spend two hours of my day really understanding it. You know, when, when no one's looking over your shoulder and that's not a metric being tracked, a lot of people say, oh, you know, can't differentiate from the underlying condition, probably due to their, you know, underlying depression or schizophrenia. And it's just like, it goes away and you get back to the metrics that count. Um, and so, you know, people wonder, you know, what, what, what's happening behind the scenes, you know, how, how are we having these absolute drug wrecks, you know, these catastrophes that go on for a long time? And I mean, 
That's one way. And I'm going to mention just one other thing just really quickly because I think it's important that people understand this. The people that work at the FDA, they usually come out of academic institutions. And so they are marinating in this same kind of soup of like biological psychiatry. They're going to the same conferences where they're hearing all of the same things from the pharmaceutical companies about you know, how to think about the conditions, how to think about safety, about talking about risks is kind of dangerous. And the people that get obsessed with the risks, they're really like Scientologists or people with a hidden agenda. So they, they're, they're carrying all of this baggage into their position at the, at the FDA. And so, and, and they also go to all the conferences with the drug company people as well. And they listen to all the same things. We're at all of the same conferences. And so, yeah, it's, I think people think about FDA and they're like, oh my God, you know, there are these people there and they're really out and they're looking at safety carefully and they're unbiased and they have all this time in the world. It is, that is just not what's happening. You know, I think that's yeah. really important because I hear from patients and families that report, you know, that put in reports into MedWatch or VAERS and they keep saying, how can we never hear from them? So I think there's this perception out there even though I know they're not going to call everyone, right? But I think they feel... They call no one. I know, exactly. They, they call... I, I just want... Having been there... Yeah. I called one person there, you know, when, when I was there, and that was unusual. My boss was like, this is really strange. We called one person. I was able to change the label for Stratera because this person went manic and we strengthened the warning label. But they, they looked at me as if it was the first time anyone had ever asked to do that. And so... They, they, if, if you're having a psychiatric issue and you say, oh, you know, this drug has caused a problem, you better believe someone's just waving their eyes at that text and saying, oh, can't differentiate from the underlying condition. I mean, it is a farce what, what is happening with, with a lot of these reports. They call no one. And then, and so that was in the office of new drugs. There's also the post-marketing office where you have people dedicated to reviewing the safety of things on the market. These people are getting like, they're reviewing 10,000 reports a week. Do you think that they're going to be able to do this, you know, to reach out to people? So it's like what they do. So here's, here's actually how it works. Eventually something will happen like a senator's kid or a congressperson's kid will get on Accutane and they will die. Arts, and then, yep. And then what they do is then they go and reach into the database and go, okay, you know, someone powerful died now. You know, it's in the it's in the media. There's political pressure, and then they pull out all of these reports, and then they review them at that time, and they go, "Oh shit, there's something here." Um, and so that's usually that's usually how things things happen. You kind of have to, and and there's other statistical metrics that they look at sometimes that will trigger a review, but most of the time, someone important dies. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I know Bart Stupak, and I worked with him back in the day, and it was yeah. his son, and he was super helpful in doing our advocacy to help try to do these congressional mm -hmm. hearings with the FDA, calling them to task. You know, Woodcock, Temple, they all got called um, to, to task back in um, the congressional hearings. But I, I always say it shouldn't take it to, you know, be personal to make change. But sometimes the reality is it needs to be personal before somebody actually does something. And that's unfortunate because I think for so many of us, we believe that the FDA has our back. We believe that they're looking at safety. And I remember I worked with the FDA on the MedWatch. I said, why there should be an app. Like imagine a consumer has an app on their phone and I can like type in like, whatever side effects going on, it goes right. So I helped them in a protocol come up with an app. Well, guess what? That whole program went away. And that would have been because they kept, I go, you need to have narratives, not just, you know, like, um, and so that's the one thing that isn't in the system. There are ways if the FDA really wanted to improve the safety. I mean, there is ways that we could hold them to what their job is. But I think with not enough people, the priority on, you know, as you explained so well, the priority being on reviews and all of the requirements and timelines that this legislation with Congress put in place years ago to, you know, it was really after the AIDS crisis too, where it was taken too long to approve the drugs, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that is something for the public to really understand is 
you have a lot of pressure and you're, you know, as reviewers and you have all the deadlines you have to meet because those are the things that mm -hmm. also you have to report back to Congress because that's what the companies are that they're holding you accountable for your side of the yeah, deal. We've agreed to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love the idea that you guys were going to develop an app because the quality of the reports in MedWatch, I mean, they're so bad and the FDA doesn't really give any prompts on how someone could really put in a very useful report where it's like, I mean, there's a couple factors that you need to put in and when you're doing causality assessments, it's like you got to describe what happened really well. You need to say that I looked at alternative explanations and I couldn't see anything. You need to give the time course of the drug you know, when it was started, when it was stopped. And um, I mean, the majority of them, they don't even have that. So I, I think FDA has done a really poor job at actually coaching people on how to give them really the most useful information for, for determining things. They just say, oh yeah, write what you want. And most of the stuff that comes in, they just say, not enough information and then they don't reach out to, to, to get to get more. So I think it's I mean, intentional. It sucks that the app wasn't developed. Yeah. I think it's intentional. Yeah. I mean, I have been t literally, I sound like a broken record. I feel like I've been saying this thing, but at this point when this was working or happening is because Congress was doing all sorts of uh, legislation, looking at the FDA, FDA performance, et cetera. And so there was a lot of focus on safety um, I think this is like 2008, 9, 10. And so they literally were interested in, let's put an app together. Let's, you know, I mean, and get patient reports because, you know, I know one of, um, I know somebody who left and now started her own medical device reporting company, but she used to work at the FDA and she was like, we could easily get a way better system put together at the FDA, but literally I've been hearing the exact same thing in 20 years since I've been doing this work that they keep blaming the affairs system. I'm like, what company, if you were a business, would you keep saying, well, yep, it's an antiquated system, but we're going to keep doing it. Yep, that sounds good. It's because you don't want to know. It's as simple as that. And, and even go, going a step back before an app, you could film one video and then you could just make people watch it. You say, if you want to submit a report, you need to watch this video. Yeah, there would be less reports from the people who really aren't committed to putting them in, but they watch one video, it's 10 minutes, explains exactly the information that is the most useful for them to hear. You film it once, it's, it gets viewed by millions of people and your work is done and they give you higher quality reports. I mean, oh my God, I mean it's such just a rubbish. Brilliant, I, yeah. yeah, that's such a great <laughs> idea. Know, know. Maybe... <laughs> maybe I have a good idea. Maybe you make that video and we make it go viral. Yeah. Because you were inside. Okay, I could do that. Yeah, you were inside. Like, yeah. what is... So if they're not going to give us the information, here's somebody who was on um, the FDA side. I'll do side. it. Yeah, I love it. I'll commit it. to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it on my YouTube channel. I'll just put a, you know, how to put in a good... Um, a good um, MedWatch report. Great. I, I would I think love to share it. it. I mean, it, it's, te it's, it's, ten minutes. it's actually on the YouTube channel already. It was done um, at the start of this year, but it was poor quality and my setup's a lot nicer now. So oh, I'm gonna do good. I think yeah. that's, I can't wait to see it and I will share it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's interesting yeah. because the one thing in talking with Madrice, um, who started Med, uh, I think it's Med Device Info or Events, mm -hmm. and it's a yeah. complete tracking system, right? It's really doing what the VAR system or what the, um, uh, what's the medical device one called? MOD, the MOD system uh, at the FDA. Mm -hmm. Well, she said the big thing, difference between devices and um, vaccines as well as the device or drugs is that they include a narrative. And so the narrative is really helpful because then you can do searching so like her company now, even when she was at the FDA, you could put in like words like knee, you know, knee pain, and you could put all the search in it and it would pull up the reports. And so I do think that there are ways that if the FDA, if I was put in charge at the FDA safety, I would have some new ideas, but I don't think yeah. they're ever going to yeah. bring me in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, 
I do want to segue because uh, there's actually something else that I wanted to pick your brain and you may not know anything about this, but I know you've got this marketing background, you know, we, you know, we talked a lot about the FDA, about the medical literature and also, you know, conferences and medical education and a little bit on the patient groups. But what, what I notice is that the media has such a favorable, uh, you, you know, generally just favorable coverage of these medications. Again, you know, very like, antidepressants, safe and effective, depression is undertreated. And, and a lot of these sound bites, they really sound like, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very pro-drug, very favorable. And so I wanted to get your perspective on how, how that happens, you know, how drug companies are able to, to capture media. Like, is it, is it just an extension of what, you know, the physician leadership is saying when they interact with the media that happens, or is there something else going on? How, how do you see that? that that issue because a lot of people are seeing very favorable things just in you know the, the news outlets yeah I, I think i think it's always been that way i mean you work with pr departments the pr department no has relationships with all the media i also feel that with even though there's supposed to be a separation between church and state between the advertising department and the the media and the reporting the reality is it does influence the fact that, you know, the advertising departments and the Pfizer is one of their biggest or the drug companies are one of their biggest clients, you're going to be a little bit more favorable. Uh, and we saw that there was, I think, a 60 Minutes uh, episode that was supposed to run years ago on the dangers of antidepressants. And it got pulled at the last minute. And it got pulled because it was the chairman of one of the companies sat on the chairman of the um, network that was doing the 60 minutes. And so I think that's something that people don't understand. Like, you know, they were the chairman of a drug company. They sat on this board. So there's a lot of people, if you look at, I think it, I actually think it might be uh, today, I think Pfizer sits on Reuters board or Reuters sits on Pfizer's board. So you have to look at that connection as well. So I think there's mm -hmm. just, um, you know, relationships. I think with the antidepressants, I've thought a lot because we had to work really hard to even get a negative story into the press back in the day and, and getting, you know, like just put Woody's story in there or put another parent's story in there to balance it because isn't that what it should be, balance? And I think there, you know, I look back and I think, I wonder how many people were on these medications as well, because even when I want to say it was like Leslie Stahl, who is one of the you know journalists for maybe 60 Minutes or one of the news shows on mm -hmm. Sunday nights, she was doing something that was supposed to be critical on some safety information. And but she came back and saying, well, I, I, it was almost like it was cognitive dissonance because she was saying how these drugs helped her husband who was on them. And she like said it in the middle of the interview. And so I think there's this like cognitive dissonance that comes in there as well. But I do believe that the companies have the ability to influence reporters. And that's why the, you know, we've seen it in the last couple of years with the pandemic, the mainstream media is spewing one um, set of information out there. And it's the independent in journalists and shows like yourself that people are starting to get information. But, you know, I do think there is influence. Uh, and I think there's just, they've done a really good job, you know, safe and effective, safe and effective. Everything is safe and effective. If you think about it, just start yeah, listening and, to those words in yeah, ads, yeah. everything safe and effective. And it, and it's like, you know, it's not about what they, you know, sometimes it's about what they don't tell you because it's, safe and effective for, you know, six to 12 weeks, you know, right. who knows what happens after you're on these drugs for five to 10 years. Is it safe and effective then? Right. And I don't, I don't think, you know, cause, cause that's, that's the main thing that's, that's often left out because that's, that's most antidepressant users these days are using them for years. For years. But they've never been shown to be safe and effective for, for years of use. No, no one knows what's happening. In fact, we're seeing that people get, have brain damage when they rapid taper them and they've been on them for a long time. They go, they go protracted. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, so much of it is, is about what you don't say. Um, but I also think. Yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I do think that 
journal, and I've had journalists tell me this. If you have ideas for stories, pitch it for me. And so I think um, meaning, and these are big journalists with, you know, big papers, big networks, et cetera. And I think mm-hmm. the journalism is also, you know, the schools are being infiltrated by pharmaceutical, um, the medical journalism schools. So like there's such influence coming down there as well, kind of like what you were talking about with, you know, if that's who's teaching it or that's where the influence is or those are where your instructors are coming from, is that having an impact? Um, impact? And then you, um, and I hear that a lot of times it's easier just taking a press release and putting that mm-hmm. and rewriting it, putting it in. And, you know, now I get a little bit more nervous about like, you know, what's going to happen with G- um, chat, G- T- you know, GTP, like who's going to be writing things, like who's going to be, you know, so it's just things we have to be aware of. So I think at the end of the day, when I think about everything that we've talked about, I, it's buyer beware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Buyer beware. Yeah. I mean, chat GPT is interesting because it's a, a accumulation of what's out there on the internet. And if you have one group that is, you know, can publish more or get more content out there, a chat GPT is going to be biased. You right. Know? <laughs> it's, so the, there is an yeah. inherent bias that's kind of built in because of yeah. what's on the internet. And then even when I, you yeah. know, I just posted something on my sub stack where I want to remind people of the checkered past from the antidepressants. Right. And so I have all of mm-hmm. these. So before the FDA advisory committee meeting on adults, the, they were only going to give the experts like Healy three minutes and some of the other side of things, three minutes, right. During the open public. And I was like, that was one of those things that I learned, Hey, the FDA really doesn't want to know both sides. They're going to only hear from who they want to, you know, hear, make formal presentations right before the committee. So, um, we hosted a, we hosted a press conference the day before the FDA advisory board And we had everybody, the ones that have been the critical thinking um, psychiatrists, Mm -hmm. you know, like the Healy's and the Glenn Mullins and and people who understand the marketing come and actually um, do a presentation, like a three, we had a three hour press conference and the media came. It was great because we're given the counter side that you weren't going to hear tomorrow. And I put it on as a history on my sub stack because I don't think people understand Today, all of the history that was, you know, that was happening in 2004, 2006, any more than I understood what was going on in 1991 as a lay person, right? And so we need to constantly remind, because all we've heard today, and if all of a sudden you were like a kid in the 2004, 2006, and you have no idea all of that work that it came to put the warnings on, you believe the narrative that's out there that is everything safe and effective. These are fine. Parents put them on the behavioral health, um, the, you know, the behavioral health, the middle, the middle, um, you know, I call it the middle layer is out there promoting them. The school systems have health systems in the schools that are giving them to yeah. kids saying yeah, they're pe- safe. Pe- pe- people just remember what they, what they hear which is mainly, you know, mental health, mental health issues are out of control, yep. underdiagnosed, undertreated, antidepressants are safe and effective. And exactly. it's just been, it's just, you know, whoever has the loudest megaphone is, is going to win. And that's pretty much what, what mo- most people know. I, I remember I used to work in a jail when I was uh, training and there was one guy who was having an adverse reaction to an antidepressant. It was just like, doc, you need to get me off this stuff. It's making me worse. And I spoke to the attending psychiatrist there and she just looked at me and she just said, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, antidepressants, they, you know, they reduce depression. They don't cause depression was, was, and it it just, it just kind of like floored me, Um, you know, and this was, you know, there's already a boxed warning on these drugs at this time. Again, you know, just even trained psychiatrists just have having no idea what's going on. And, and I think that's also like, you know, when you, when, when you get pushback from journalists as well, it's like, you know, they've been told a story about these drugs, you know, probably from someone in their family member. If you have a family of four, you know, one person's probably on a psychiatric medication. You've probably, 
you know, had, you know, bought into a story of, of, you know, these are really needed and it's, it's, it's rebalancing your hormones. And I think to have something, you know, that personal to you challenged by, Hey, these drugs may not be for everyone. They may actually be dangerous long term. I also think, yeah, like you said, cognitive dissonance really mm-hmm. comes in because it's challenging what they've heard from people that they've been taught to trust, you know, news outlets, CNN, you know, Reuters, whoever it's going to be, you know, their doctor. And then people don't like that. Right. It's very uncomfortable. And people don't really yeah. want, to, I mean, I think, you know, we become in some ways a society that is la- like lazy. I mean, if we already hear it and our doctor told us, and I'm not putting the blame on people at all. But, you know, we do need to do our own research. We do need to push back. We need to be challenged. We need to n- not be afraid of wh- asking the question, why do I believe a certain way? Like that cognitive dissonance, like, wait a minute, this isn't what I've been told, but I need to maybe be in a, an uncomfortable place and be willing to look at the information and maybe challenge it, especially, you know, when you get... Uh, when you have people uh, where you said antidepressants, people are on them for all these tens, 20 years now, and they don't even know. And I remember um, meeting one of, he was a filmmaker, and that's why we have all these, um, the films from the 2004 and six press conference is because a filmmaker actually came to present because there was no social media back then, right? And the FDA didn't record these meetings like they do today. So this it doesn't exist, this information online. Um, but anyways, this filmmaker, and he contacted me because he started realizing, or he asked the question. He sat with what I'm telling people to do. His mom died and his baby was born and he felt nothing. He didn't feel happy. He didn't feel sad. Two completely life exist, you know, two life experiences that, should be in, you know, you would feel something different, right? Mom died suddenly and a baby born. Like those are two, you shouldn't feel nothing flat. And so he felt flat. So he started going down that rabbit hole of asking the question, I wonder like, is it, it's my drug. And so he went back and he's like, why did I, you know, he had been on, um, he had been on Paxil for like 12 years. Then he went back and started going, why was I on it? It turned out it was like a breakup from a college girlfriend. And he's not even like, he's not even with that woman. He's with another woman, like married, but now having a baby, but it all, but never actually stopped along the way and asked that question because it, you know, we've been trained or if you start trying to go off of them, it might get worse because you didn't know about any of the withdrawals and so it became yeah, I mean, this he was big probably mess. like, yeah, he's like sold a lie about it rebalancing his chemicals or something like that. Yeah. Um, so you think it's and, like a yeah, daily it, it, vitamin. <laughs> That's what people say in social media these days. I don't know if you've seen it. You know, there's a lot of like uh, popular people saying, yeah, this is just like my daily vitamin for my brain. Oh my God. Um, and <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's crazy because it's, you know, one, one of the one of the scariest things, and I, I th- do think it takes something dramatic like the birth of your child to just say, "Oh shit!" Like, why did I feel like absolutely nothing um, when my child was born? This is meant to be like a peak experience in my life. That you start to look, but I mean, when like once you've once you've started to notice that you you know pe- people call it like spellbinding. You know, is is what they say. It's like you can be on these medications and. Uh, because they blunt your cognitive faculties sometimes in a therapeutic way, but just mainly it's a general blunting. Like they may not be serving you well, and they may not be improving you in any way, and 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 you don't realize. Um, um, and that's isn't that scary? You know, it is. Like I, you know, I still when yeah. I think when he actually looked back and realized, oh my god, like I'm not even like I'm still on this drug from a breakup. Like, I'm not sad about the breakup anymore, but you think about it. Why did we give, I mean, that is what we've done is also, you know, like, oh, you're sad. Well, when you think about all the marketing stuff that we've talked about and the screening and we've, and the influence, no wonder why when somebody comes in, we're not saying, the doctor's not saying, oh, how are you? I'm kind of like, I don't know, I'm down, whatever. Well, oh, have you ever thought about 
a drug. Like after Woody died, I had doctors who said, do you think you need something? And I was like, I looked at her and I go, uh, I, first of all, I think this drug is what killed my husband. But I go, and yeah. then I looked at her, I go, but my husband died. Aren't I supposed to hurt? And she literally said to me, but you don't need to. Oh my God. That was a doctor that I trusted. And because I literally wanted to rip my heart out, but it should want to rip my heart out because my husband died and I had to learn yeah. to live with it. I, w I would never take and want to flatline that feeling because that was what it means to be fully alive, which means the up and the down. Wow. Yeah. I could go on and talk to you for a I know. Years, I know. Kim, it's really fun talking yeah, to somebody yeah. who gets it. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I'm going to say and just throw it out. This is probably the first of uh, many conversations that we're going to have. But Great. Um, I, I want to I thank you uh, for coming on and sharing your insights. I cannot wait to promote this video as um, one that's going to be really exciting to, to go over all of the ways, you know, what, um, all, all of, sorry, all of the reasons why people don't know um, right. about the harms of drugs. And you've given us invaluable insights into that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was really fun. And I love having conversations with people who ask those kind of questions and are open to listening.